This is the introductory video for the Hooke's Law experiment. The Hooke's Law apparatus consists of a spring with a mass hanger dangling underneath it, and then behind the mass hanger there is a scale, which is going to allow us to measure how far down the spring stretches when we add a mass to the mass hanger. You're going to be making a graph of the force on the spring versus the extension, that is how far down it's stretched. What you should find is that you get a linear graph and the slope of the graph, if you've set it up correctly, will give you the spring constant, k. The spring constant is just a measure of how stretchy this particular spring is. Now the extension of the spring, x, is what we're going to want. This is what we're going to be graphing. That's always defined to be the position of the mass hanger after you've added the masses, minus the position of the mass hanger before you added the masses. So this is the position it was at before we ever started taking data. To make the math easy on ourselves, we're actually going to set this initial position to zero, and that way x is just going to be equal to the final position. Next part of the video, I'm going to show you how you do that. So the first thing you need to do is take all masses off of the mass hanger, and then you're going to have to decide what you're going to use as your pointer on the scale. So we could use the bottom of the mass hanger as our pointer, or we could use this little needle here, which is there for that particular reason. And you can arrange for that to very lightly touch the scale. The reason why we want it to be as close to touching the scale as possible is if the thing you're trying to measure is some distance away from the scale, then the angle that you view the object at changes what you take the reading to be. That effect is called parallax. So this little pointer gets closer to the scale, that means parallax is less of a problem. To completely get rid of the problem of parallax, what you need to do is lower your head such that you're looking at the pointer and its reflection in the mirrored scale, and you need to get them lined up with one another. Wherever they line up is where you take your reading from. If you don't do that, then just viewing the pointer from a different angle could change your reading and give you strange results. So I'm going to use this pointer as my marker on the scale, and I want to get that lined up with zero. How do I do that? Well, these two clips here, you can squeeze them together and slide the whole scale up and down. And so you want to, with as much care as you can, get that pointer aimed right at the zero mark. You should do that quite carefully. So assuming that you've zeroed the pointer position carefully, you're now ready to take data. So you would add masses and measure how far down the spring has stretched. I will warn you that although Hooke's law predicts that the relationship between the mass added and the extension of the spring should be linear, when the masses are either too small or too large, you do see nonlinear effects. So I recommend that this first data point that you take be no less than 20 grams of added mass. Even with that, you may see nonlinear effects on your graph. The maximum amount of mass that you should add to these springs should be no more than 170 grams in total, and to get the best possible graph, you should actually span the entire range. So your minimum should be at least 20 grams, and your maximum should go right up to 170 grams. That will give you the best graph, and thus the best results. Now you're free to choose what increments of mass you add to this, but you do need about 8 to 10 data points to get a decent graph. So add your masses in increments of your own choosing, and in each case, measure how far down the spring has stretched. You can, by the way, twist those pointers, and make sure you steady it in order to take data. You should also, by the way, think about what your uncertainty on that value should be. You will, of course, have reading uncertainty due to reading this millimeter scale, but you might want to think about adding some physical uncertainty, too, for the thickness of the pointer and how steady you actually can get this before you start taking data. Remember that impatience is not a valid source of uncertainty, so you should wait until this thing stops moving. Now when you've added all the masses, you're also going to reproduce your results by taking the masses off and remeasuring the extension x. So like I said, it's just a way to reproduce the results to make sure that when you did it the first time, that you were getting reasonable results. So if the extensions you get when you're adding masses are in good agreement with the extensions you get when you're removing masses, you would average the two equivalent values together, and then you're going to use that averaged value on your graph. Now let's talk about what the uncertainty on the force should be. That's something you're going to have to calculate, but the uncertainty arises from the uncertainty on the mass of the hanger. Now you should go and weigh this and use the instrument uncertainty of the scales that is given to you. And the only question then is, what's the uncertainty on these added masses? 
Well, if the manufacturer has done a good job with these, then they should have a very, very small instrument uncertainty. So small, in fact, that it's negligible compared to the instrument uncertainty of the scale we use to weigh this mass hanger. In other words, you should assume that these added masses are exact, that when it says 50 grams, it's exactly 50 grams. There is, of course, a very small instrument uncertainty, but we're effectively going to neglect it. So weigh the mass hanger and use the instrument uncertainty of the scale as your uncertainty on the total mass that was dangling off of this spring. Now this is the version of Hooke's Law that's listed in your lab manual, and I just want to discuss for a moment how you go about graphing your data correctly such that the slope of the graph will give you k. So let's compare this to the equation for a straight line on a graph, y equals mx plus b. You can see that if you graph f, the force on the spring, along the y-axis, and you put the extension x on the x-axis, then the slope should be equal to k. So that's the way you should do this is if you put f on your y-axis and x on your x-axis, then the slope of the graph will be k immediately. If you swap those two axes, then your slope is going to be equal to 1 over k. So you can still get the value, but it's just a little more work.